All right, I'm back with another chatty work with me. And today's topic is the question, are there too many resellers out there? And I'll deep dive into that as I work with you. So I'm going to set a timer and this is going to be 45 minutes working and then a 15 minute break at the end. And so let's just jump right in. So five, four, three, two, one, let's go. All right, I just turned on my steamer. I am gonna steam a few clothes, then um, take a few photos and kind of go back and forth. I usually do batch steaming, but I know that's not as exciting. <laughs> so anyways, hopefully I have enough water here to get me through this. I probably don't, but that's all right. All right, so today's topic, uh, one of the things I hear a lot of people say is, are a few things. One of them being, uh, there are so many resellers at my store, my thrift store, I can't find anything good. Another being, there are too many resellers out there and there's too much competition for the same items that I'm selling online. And so it's affecting your sales. What were some of the other reasons? Um, more resellers means undercutting prices at times, possibly. Again, these are all comments I've heard many, many times. That's usually where I get, where I get inspiration for these videos. And if you're new here, welcome. My name's Courtney. I'm a reseller on eBay and Poshmark. And I do these chatty work with me's to kill two birds with one stone. Talk about a topic and also get some work done. <laughs> so, and if you wanna work with me, I have a timer on the screen. This is the uh, Pomodoro method that I use when I'm feeling unmotivated or need to feel more motivated. And um, you can do it with me, you can do it on your own. You could do 25 minute sessions, you could do um, 45 minute sessions, whatever you want, you can Google it or I'll, I'll write it on the screen or something. Anyways, to the point of this video, um, this topic is one of those things that I, I think it just depends on a lot of things. But uh, those are the three main ones that I hear people talking about as far as complaining that there are too many resellers. Feel free to leave a comment below if you can think of any other reasons um, and how you feel about them. I love reading your guys' comments. But first things first, I became a reseller in 2018. Already I'm getting distracted. Uh, I became a reseller in 2018, first part-time when I was working full-time with a career job, and then I moved to more of a full-time status. These days, I'm not really full-time on anything. I just, I do this, I do three YouTube channels, I do real estate, um, and all that fun jazz. So my time is a little bit more mixed up these days, but I do resell a lot, and it is a big chunk of my income and my daily activities. And... I will say this, I don't remember the last time I bought a piece of clothing new. Um, I've never really big in, been big into clothing in general. I tend to wear a lot of the same things, uh, right? <laughs> I feel like I wear these like loose sweaters. Why do I always wear these loose sweaters? I don't know, they're just comfortable and it's getting hot because I've got the steamer going <laughs> and I'm up in my attic or attic or loft, but um, so I'm probably gonna tie my hair back real quick. But anyways, uh, I, I shop a lot more on the pre-owned market because I am a reseller. So more sellers usually, not always, but usually can mean more buyers as well because sellers are buyers at times. So with that, I think that, yeah, this is definitely going to be a sauna video. So that's all right. So, you know, with that concept, do I buy as much as I sell? No, I'm here to make a profit. In fact, just the other day, someone, um, which I don't get these very often on Poshmark anymore, but I definitely got them in the beginning, but someone left me a comment and said, you know, I, I'm sorry for asking, but do you do trades? And I just usually block people who ask me to do trades because that's definitely not what I'm here to do. I'm here to make some sort of profit so I can pay my bills. Um, and I'm not offended. It's just, that's not the type of Poshmark I do, but I think there is a culture shift right now. Um, and there has been for, for quite some time of, it's kind of trendy to shop pre-owned. It's kind of trendy to tell your friends that you bought something at a thrift store. Maybe not everyone, um, but I mean, I see a lot of teenagers when I go to the bins in the afternoons or the weekends, um, and they're there with friends. It's like a social thing. College students, it's like an excuse to buy you know, things cheaper or even just have more unique outfits because you're not just gonna be buying the same stuff at Forever 21 that all your friends are buying. So I think there's definitely, I don't know any stats, but I know every time I read any stats from any 
any major secondhand company, ThreadUp, Poshmark, eBay, that the trajectory of the pre-owned market is expected to continue going up. And, you know, I mean, it's always a worry when things get more expensive and maybe sales dip and maybe people are going to spend less. But then that also means people still want to spend, but maybe they'll want to spend it on pre-owned versus brand new to save a little bit of money. I don't know. We're not talking to <laughs> any inflation talk here. But I do think that more sellers can mean more buyers. And there is going to hopefully be more demand in the coming years. Um, and hopefully for a long time after. I think that, you know, there's just a lot more people who are trying to be socially aware and, you know, try to make purchases that are not fast fashion, not contributing to landfill waste, um, just being more mindful of that stuff for the environment and whatnot. And that just kind of means there's hopefully going to be more buyers. So if there are more sellers, Hopefully there will also be more buyers, if that makes sense. So that's the first point I wanted to address, that I have been a loyal secondhand shopper since becoming a reseller. And it's not that I didn't buy things secondhand before, but I typically bought home stuff. And I know I've talked about this. I typically bought like furniture, home stuff, and um, you know, like artwork and stuff like that. I would occasionally look for flannels because I was always looking for those for some reason. And I just always liked looking at thrift store or yeah, thrift stores for that. But these days I own like if I if I want some new yoga leggings, I'm going to go immediately to Poshmark and eBay and look for it on the pre-owned market. Um, and that's what I do with everything these days. So, yeah, that's the first point. Second point is um, so competition. I don't know. I've read a lot of articles. I'll link one below just for reference on the benefits of competition in business. But when I go to a, an intersection, now this is mostly when I'm in LA and there's a lot more businesses there. Uh, when I go to an intersection and there are competing businesses, let's just say there's an Albertsons, uh, Trader Joe's and a Walmart you know, all of them may have groceries, all of those may be stops for, you know, people to buy groceries and other things. And, uh, you know, they're, they're competing against each other. What my understanding is, is that the reason they do that is because if there's a one stop place, you know, people don't have to drive around to a million different locations, but they can just drive to one place and maybe they buy something at Albertsons. Maybe they buy a few things at Walmart. Maybe they buy a few things at, uh, I don't remember the last one I said, Trader Joe's. Um, so they, they can actually go to all of them if they wanted, or it kind of just ups the game for all of them. You know, like the competition does mean you want friendlier staff, you want better pricing. And some of this at large corporations, you know, it's not the, the stores that are necessarily dictating a lot of it, but they can dictate uh, staff, you know, how they hire. So for example, I used to work at a coffee shop and uh, we had in one community that I worked at, we had about four different coffee shops within a two block radius. And this was San Francisco, so very, that's walking distance. And four coffee shops that people could choose from. And the concept there that people would come in and say, yeah, I like the coffee at the other place, but I like the staff here. Or I like the coffee here, you know, and that's why I come back. Like whatever the reason is, we had people coming, choosing us over the competition for whatever reason, price, staff, the product, whatever it was. And I never really felt when I was in that situation, looking at my numbers, you know, looking at dips in sales or increase in sales or whatever the case was, I never really felt like those coffee shops were competition. I felt like people have choices and that's what makes this two square block radius kind of fun is that people can come here and they have choices for coffee shops. So the reason I'm saying this is Competition with businesses can be great. Competition with resellers can also be great. And I have 100% gone into thrift stores and seen, uh, you know, like five other resellers and carts full. And I just walk in and I'm sitting there going, oh man, they got all the good stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to get anything good. I may as well walk out. But if I actually stay and start walking around, I almost always have a decent day. 
And it's partly because we may be looking for different things. We may be interested in selling different things. Maybe it's someone that likes to pick up the same exact stuff, but there's too much of it to go around. And I know every situation is different. I'm not saying that there can't be a day that you genuinely walk in and it's absolute nothing available. Come on. It's nothing available and you really don't find anything. But I'm just saying in my experience, it usually I can still find stuff if there are other resellers. And as far as... I do have notes just so that I can keep on track. But for some reason, I decided to do like sentences this time. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I basically, I really have learned through time and experience that other resellers and thrift stores is not competition. Other resellers on platforms, you know, I've been using my mannequin more these days. And partly it's like, does it look better on a mannequin? I, I know it takes a little bit of extra time for me to do photos on my mannequin, but is that going to help me stand out from other people? I know some people like to model. That's not ever going to be me, partly because, you know, I mean, unless you're small enough where you could fit in the majority of clothes, it's, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. Um, but anyways, I think that competition can be good. Um, and the article down below that I'm linking is talking about good competition and bad competition. And one of the notes I wrote on here as a, an example from that article, but again, you can read the whole article down below, um, is they were talking about good competition versus bad competition, that there are both in business. And good competition means usually that, let's say there are 10 businesses, they're all vying for the same, is it vying? Is that the right word? Whatever. Someone can correct me. Um, they're all wanting the same customers. I think it's fine. I actually don't know if I've ever really looked up that word, but it just came out so naturally that I feel like that's right. Anyways, they're all wanting the same customers and with the same customers that, that forces them to have better pricing, have nicer staff, have a cleaner environment, um, have more sales, like whatever the, whatever's going to get more customers in their store, it makes them perform better as a business. That competition makes all of them work a little bit harder. So it's better for the customers. It's better for employees because if they want a friendly staff, there's competition. If they treat their staff horribly, that employee might go over to, you know, I don't know, <laughs> Target over Walmart. And they're like, yeah, I'm still going to make minimum wage regardless of where I'm at. But I have a friend working at Target. And I, I don't know, I don't know why I'm just picking two like big box stores, you know, so they, they want to maybe have decent pay for their employees so they can keep them on. They maybe want to have better benefits. They want to have, you know, consistent breaks. And again, it's, this is just for comparison of just why competition can be good. If you have 10 stores that are trying to get the same customers, they're all going to up their game a little bit and hopefully be better places to work. Now, the bad competition is when someone comes in and buys all 10 of those stores and merges them all. And now it's all under kind of one, one business. It's all one business. Now they're basically, there's no reason for them to compete really because they're just competing with themselves. And, you know, if uh, I, I'm trying to think of a company that maybe acquires a whole bunch of companies. Oh, there's a little spot on there. Darn it. Uh, a company that acquires a lot of companies. Um, you know, like Facebook acquired, uh, Instagram and probably has acquired a number of other companies. And when they start doing that, they start basically not having that competition, almost removing that competition. They start moving more into the bad competition. And this again, is not making any statements on the examples, more or less just trying to find an example off the top of my head. So I think that with resellers specifically, I know personally that if, all resellers start modeling, that's gonna create a better photo than I can provide because I'm not modeling. Now again, maybe I can use my mannequin more, maybe I can have brighter lights or a cleaner background, less clutter, whatever it is that you can make improvements, but you're probably making those improvements because you are competing with people to sell the same, the same or similar products. So that's just my take on that. Um, I have a question and I don't really have an answer, but I, I'm gonna make a guess. And you guys can make a guess down below if you want. <laughs> By no means am I forcing you to, but I do like reading what you guys think about certain things. And my question is, how long do you think the average, is it creating a steam bath for you guys too? Is it like steam vision? I'm just getting that like natural 
dewiness. Uh, it's not even that hot today, but again, all the heat rises to my loft. I'm in an A-frame and I think the high today was 74, which is beautiful. Um, but because it's been warm all day and I have a house full of windows, it warms up the house. It's probably, if I had to guess, 85 up here right now. <laughs> Down, downstairs, it's probably only like 75 to 78, somewhere around there, but uh, up here. Yeah. Anyways, so my question is, how long do you think the average person that tries reselling to make money, not is just selling a few things out of their closet. So let's say they list at least 10 items a month for a few months. Like they actually kind of want to make it a side hustle or a full-time hustle. Um, and, and that's how they look at it. How long do you think the average time span until they quit? That's not the right way of saying it. Basically, What's the average lifespan of a reseller? That a reseller that actually wants to turn a profit, not just kind of sell things out of their own closet. And I'll let you go down and leave a comment. You can pause the video if you don't want me to throw out my guess and affect your guess. Um, but I don't know, I've thought about it. I think there's so much turnover with this industry because so many people maybe watch a video on a haul and someone's saying, I sold all this amazing stuff and I made thousands and thousands of dollars in a day or a week or a month or, you know, whatever, or this is the best side hustle or they read an article or whatever, however they found reselling. Uh, and then they try it and they realize, oh, this is a lot of work. Maybe they give it a few months, maybe they give it six months and then they decide, nope. I mean, I know it happens pretty regularly. All right, I'm gonna take some pictures. My audio might be a little questionable. Because, but I'll turn off the steamer because that might be making background noise. Um, but I'll try and edit the audio a little bit if, when I turn away. But um, so I, if I had to get, so I have people that message me who are in Southern California. They know that I'm in Southern California and they will say, they will send me a message. And this is another time I usually don't respond or, um, I'm just not interested in buying out people's inventory. It's really uncomfortable for me. I, I know there's probably going to be stuff I would never want. Um, and, and I think partly cause I do do YouTube. I do enjoy the thrill of the hunt. Um, and I'll probably talk about this in another video of kind of what I'm doing differently this summer. That's kind of affecting that. Hold on. I've got a measure. Okay. If you're measuring with me, close your ears. 26 and 55. All right. 26, 55. I know I sell these all the time. I think these are linked below, but I love these whiteboards. I've tried others. These are the best ones I've, what did I say, 26, 55? Um, these are the best ones I've tried. And um, I was really happy I found them. I can't remember the brand though. Anyways, so we're gonna get a little mannequin action and dress time. Is that a spot? Uh, it's faint. We're just going to list it because I think that's going to. So if I had to guess, I would say the average is six months because there's people like me that have been doing it for years. There's people have, that have done it a lot longer than me. Poshmark specifically, I don't know how old they are. Eight years, maybe. I don't know. Um, eBay has been around what feels like forever, but what, maybe 30 years. Uh, I Again, this is all guessing, but. You guys can leave a comment if you guys know the exact dates. But the point is, is that there are some eBay sellers who have been selling since the beginning of time. You know, so let's say 20 years. And there are some Poshmark sellers who've been selling, you know, for five, six, seven, eight years, something around there. Oh, that's what it is. That's why I don't take many photos because, is this on? Oh, good, okay. I have this extra phone down here or up here. So I can take photos and still film with my phone. <laughs> That's what I do, I film with my iPhone. I totally forgot that I was gonna be doing this, but at least this is turned on and it was plugged in. So at least I had some advanced thinking. All right, where are we at with time? We have 26 minutes left. So moral of this concept that I'm trying to get at is even though it feels like there are always new resellers and always new people trying it, a lot of, a lot of them drop off. And so personally, while I do think, let's see here. Um, I haven't used this one in a while. How do I get to the, 
This is an older phone, so uh, how do I get to the camera? Oh my gosh, it's been forever since I... Camera? Oh, there we go. Okay. Jeez. All right. So anyways, I personally think competition is good. Um, and I think if the average reseller is coming on the market, trying it for six months and leaving, it's just that ebb and flow. And hopefully they, they like the, at least the purchasing price or the purchase experience so that even if they leave reselling, they'll, they'll continue to buy. That's my goal. Or that would be my goal. Oh gosh, why did I have to pick a maxi item? That's so hard to photograph where I'm at. Partly the reason why this is so short right here is because this is where the A-frame goes down and there's a bedroom over here, so it keeps going down. So at least I have this one little flat wall. This doesn't show from my downstairs area, so that's why I picked it, but it's really hard for longer items. All right. So let's see, what else do I have to say about this topic? So I'll link the, the, uh, the article down below that I mentioned. Um, so one thing that I've also been thinking about is what comes first, the chicken or the egg in reselling? So what came first, the seller or the buyer? I don't know if that's the best example, but that's the example I'm using. <laughs> so in my opinion, a platform should want good sellers, the best sellers, because if they have the best sellers on the market, then those sellers hopefully will have the best product, the best experience, the best packaging, the quick, quick ship time. Apparently I can't take photos and talk at the same time. Um, they're just going to have an overall better customer experience, hopefully just based off of experience. So the reason I bring this up, um, So I, I'm, I'm just going to use eBay because that's my preferred uh, platform. It's not perfect, but it's the one I prefer. If eBay tries to get the best sellers on the market by having the lowest fees, I'm not saying they do uh, have the lowest fees, but if they go after the best sellers, then hopefully that competition between the best sellers will bring in more and more buyers. And if the sellers are getting a lot of people to buy stuff from them, then they'll, they'll keep buying. They'll keep searching there when they're looking for whatever it is they're looking for. All right, I need to... Sometimes this camera does not do the best job at focusing, so... All right, um, I need to take a sip of my electrolytes because apparently my doing this is me, like all the water is coming out of me right now. And this is not a break. It's good to hydrate. It's a raspberry lemonade electrolyte flavor. Um, so in that situation where a platform is really going after the best sellers to get the best buyers and to keep them coming back, it's the competition is actually good for sellers and buyers because if more and more buyers come because of good experience, hopefully that means more and more sales for the sellers, if that makes sense. So one observation I've made recently is, now I have not followed, we have a ring light behind me that's interfering with my photo skills right now. Um, one thing I've noticed with Poshmark, now I did watch a video. I've, I just wanted to watch one to see what someone had to say about it. I picked the YouTube channel the Phi Resellers. I think that's how they pronounce it. Um, so I've watched a few of their videos before. They're super sweet. I think that they have some um, good things to say. They keep things relatively positive, but they're also very honest, which I personally appreciate. Anyways, so when I was looking for a video to kind of explain to me what was going on with currently with the Poshmark algorithm, I, where am I at? All right, that one's going to just not go on a mannequin. This one is going to go on a mannequin. So I decided to watch their video. I just did a quick search like Poshmark algorithm and then I sorted it by most recent video and I saw that they had done one on a recent thing called a fireside chat. I know I saw something on Poshmark app. I just don't participate in anything Poshmark so it just doesn't 
did I remember what the measurements were? No, because I can't, I have to say them out loud if I'm gonna remember, remember them. Oh, geez. The best part of these, 19, 19, 20. The best part of these for me is how hard it is to talk and work. <laughs> Um, so hopefully it's at least entertaining for you guys to see me struggle because it is a struggle. All right. So, so anyways, I watched their video and this was a week ago when I was trying to think of an idea for the next chatty work with me. And I thought they actually addressed a lot of points that I've talked about in previous videos. So I think we're very much on the same page of our opinion on Poshmark's motives. You know, that if, um, for example, I think they addressed that Poshmark is um, trying to get people to maybe sell things out of their own closet, take that money that they earn, and then buy stuff on the app, and then Poshmark gets both fees. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but they talked about it. I'll link their video below if you want to hear their thoughts. I, could, I agreed with quite a bit of it. Um, but I also was not a part of the fireside chat and I also don't keep up with Poshmark stuff. So I don't have an opinion on everything, but I thought they did a, a good recap anyways. So one of the things that when they said that, that's that same thing that they're trying to get people to sell things out of their own closet. And one of the changes they've made with the algorithm that they've tested and are still testing where they're trying to encourage, uh, some of the sellers, some of the items for sale that don't have any sort of um, at good SEO keywords. Maybe it just says red top or J crew red top instead of how we all write or most of us write a whole bunch of words for SEO that they were doing this like two, 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 two thing. Again, I'll link their video. I'm sure that they'll do a better job explaining it. But I did hear that from a friend that they were testing that out and it was frustrating people. But from Poshmark's perspective, what they're trying to do is to get more sellers to sell things and increase sales that way. I think the problem with that, from my perspective, is to create a, they're trying to recruit someone to be a buyer and a seller, all in one, all in one package. At least that's what it appears to be. And the seller experience and the buyer experience is two very different things. And it's very hard to cater to both of them at the same time. And what I mean by this is what are sellers looking for? Low fees, quick sales, good buyers, maybe people want easy returns um, or uh, no returns rather. Um, you know, people from a selling perspective, they want to sell their stuff and they want to make decent money and they want to do it easily. Buyers want stuff for cheap and they want to be able to search for things and find what they're looking for. And so I feel like Poshmark, in my opinion, if they're trying to have people become a buyer and a seller, they're kind of con conflicting themselves with how they're like, you can't make both sides happy. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons I typically will buy on eBay rather than Poshmark, because I know there are some sellers on eBay like myself that allow returns. And if something doesn't fit me, I would rather be able to, to return it. Now I'm a different exception. I think resellers are, we can always resell something, but you know, Buyers want different things. Like buyers want, what is it? When a case opens up on Poshmark, who wants to win? Both the buyer and the seller. And Poshmark's in a very difficult, you know, situation right there because you can't, you can't make both sides happy in that sense, unless they just eat the cost completely, which they don't do often. Um, all right, we are still getting glares. We're getting glares from windows and ring lights. Oh, geez. I don't even think I've taken, I think I've taken two photos, but I've steamed a lot. I haven't really, but I've steamed some in my free sauna. So anyways, um, I think that, you know, eBay, for example, at least this is my perspective or my experience as a seller who sells 99, 99% of the transactions on eBay that I have are selling. Maybe 1% is buying. Maybe I buy a pair of yoga leggings or um, maybe a new, I can't remember, like maybe tape or packaging supplies or some of that kind of stuff. Um, I am a seller on eBay, but they still do send me emails of like, here's a Memorial Day sale. 
coupon if you want to buy electronics or whatever it is that they're trying to promote. And so I'm not saying that they can't cross promote their stuff, but I think that Poshmark goes into it wanting to be a one-stop shop and wanting people to have this community aspect, which I know they really love, um, where people are just selling and buying and chatting and socializing and meeting and all of this stuff. But there's a lot of conflict there. There's a lot of like, you know, in my opinion, Poshmark should really focus on having the best search. Like if you look at Google, for example, where am I at? I'm trying to look for a, uh, a hanger that matches the ones that I use. So we're just going to go with this one. Um, if you remember the days when we had all these different search engines, like when the internet really became big and we had Yahoo, we had Ask Jeeves, we had Google, we had like there were like six different places you could search for things. And these days it's almost, I mean, I know other people do use other things, but a lot of people use Google. I mean, these days we don't even say search anymore. We just say, just Google it. But back in the day, it was a little bit more competition. But what Google did was they really mastered the search. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect. Again, I'm not trying to like promote any products here or discourage any products, just using examples. But I think that Poshmark if they really, really want to go hard on something, looking at the algorithm of how can we place products in front of a buyer and read their mind before they even know that they want something. Um, for example, I used to get, I haven't gotten one in a little bit, so I'm not sure if they've gotten rid of it or if they're just testing other things, but they used to send like once a week, look at items we think that you'll like. And it was like a thing that you could click on the app and then you could see all these items that they would recommend. Now I don't have any saved searches. I don't have my saved sizes. Where am I at? You gotta do measurements. So I'm not, a, I'm not a good Poshmark buyer, but I do a lot of searching on Poshmark. Hold on, we've gotta do measurements, so I've gotta focus. 12, nine, 12, nine, 26. 12, nine, 26. I feel like I should just title this the sauna chatty work with me, but I feel like there's going to be more of these. So if you guys don't mind a Dewey look, that's where we're at. So anyways, um, what was I even talking about? Poshmark? Oh, search. So I know that their algorithm, they're trying to push some profiles up to the top of the search. Some are based on, on um, sharing and some they're basing it off of maybe profiles that are newer. They're trying to encourage those private profiles to get to the top so they can maybe get sales. So maybe they have, they like the experience on the app, the app and they'll continue using it. But that's maybe gonna provide a bad buying experience for someone and maybe it's not gonna provide the exact thing that someone wants. Um, if someone is searching, like I'm searching for Made well, tiered dress, fall flowers. I just listed that today. That's like the exact title from Made Well. If I search for that and then two of my uh, search results are that, and then the next two are just Made Well green dress or Made Well dress, not even the exact dress, and then two are the exact dress, that's not really creating a good buyer experience. Plus, if they do buy something from someone who is maybe newer, not we all started new, I'm not saying that you can't be a good seller if you're new, but you maybe aren't going to ship it as quickly. Maybe you didn't um, check for flaws as, as normally as maybe experienced sellers do. Um, maybe you won't even ship at all. Maybe you were off the app, you stopped using it, you deleted it, and you won't even get the notifications. So I really feel like Poshmark should focus on creating the best search out there if they want to compete. And with that, I use those emails, for example. Oh my gosh, I need to focus. We're gonna do a little. I used, I used to get those little like notifications in the app, like these are items we think you'll like. And I swear, I do all this searching. So even though I don't have things saved or a lot of purchases, you'd think that they would base it off my purchases, which are things like some aloe yoga, maybe some AG jeans, maybe, uh, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what I bought there. 
that maybe they would have those, those brands populated and saved, but also things I'm searching for on the regular. So even if I'm not saving the searches, that maybe they're going to understand like, oh, she's been searching a lot recently for anthropology and free people and, you know, frame denim and these kinds of things. Maybe that should be on our suggested, not these random brands that I was getting. And honestly, they were so absurdly random and everything was like five, 10, $15. And maybe, I don't know, like, were they just, I don't know. I just didn't get it. And it was frustrating me. Like, why on earth do you guys think that I would want this stuff? Um, it just, it was baffling with all the information they have on me, things I've sold, things I've searched for, things I've actually bought. And then they give me these recommendations. They're not predicting what I want. In fact, they're just doing the opposite. They're just kind of annoying me. Like, do you know me at all, Poshmark? I've been on your app almost every day for, you know, almost four years. And these are the recommendations. So anyways, this isn't a Poshmark video. The point of this is, um, I do think that the motives of sellers and buyers are different, the goals there. And I think platforms do kind of have to treat them separately, even if there is a little commingling at times. And, you know, so, but all of that aside, um, sellers, uh, if a platform is good, they want good sellers and they want good buyers. They want buyers to keep coming back, buyers to buy more stuff. That makes sellers happy and sellers will list more stuff. It's just this like full circle type of thing. And, you know, when I sit here and see people say, oh, this is what I was doing. Uh, when I see people comment on, on my videos or in the community talking about, oh, there's too many resellers. I mean, I've had people say like, it's people like you, I'm not complaining, like this is just part of the, the gig on YouTube, but people who will say, it's people like you who are spreading the, the reselling stuff, making it worse for all of us. My sales have gone down because, you know, you're sharing this stuff and, but that's the part I don't understand. Why is competition bad? If you're scared of people competing with you, then you're probably not confident in your products or your photos or your pricing or, I mean, I think competition can be good. Now, I don't think you should go into it of like, oh, I want to compete with everyone and I want to beat everyone. I don't think it needs to be like a negative space. Did I get the, no, I did not. Jeez, little marker marks. So let's see, we have seven minutes and 58 seconds. So I know it can be frustrating. Um, I know I've talked about this before that I have a honey hole and I'll usually have it for like six months to a year and then I'll start going in and I'll start noticing that like I can't find anything and it used to be like that amazing, amazing place where I could always walk out with multiple bags. Um, you know, the bins, for example, oh my gosh, the competition of the bins. Can we even talk about it? Uh, I think that's why so many people don't want YouTube people to film because they, they think that we're sharing something that's not known about bringing more attention and bringing more competition. Again, I go to the bins. I mean, I go to multiple, but I go to them all the time with resellers. A lot of them selling very similar stuff to me and I still find stuff. Um, or even if I feel like I'm in competition with a thrift store. So recently I did a video where I was at Savers. I did a video, a thrift with me there like a year and a half ago or something. And um, hold on, I've got to somehow do a show that there's a pocket right here. Anyways, so I don't think I measured this. All right, we could call this the sauna the uh, sweaty, scatterbrained, chatty work with me. That's, that's the new name of this, this work with me. Um, but even at a store like that, where I'm I feel like I'm competing with the store employees because they do know brands and they're marking things up. And that's, I mean, they mark stuff up at every single thrift store. That particular store is just one of the worst I've seen. Oh, I've got to focus on measurements. Here we go again. All right, we're going to do 12 and a half. We're going to do... 12, 9, 12, 9, 24. All right. Even when I feel like I'm competing with a thrift store, I still find stuff that they don't know about or that they miss. And if anything, it makes me a better person because I have to look things up. I can't just depend on the loyal 
bread and butter stuff that always sells for me because maybe that's the stuff that's that's marked up. I have to think a little bit more creatively when I'm there, if that makes sense. Did I already? I already took photos of this, I think. So are there too many resellers? I don't think so. And, you know, you take a time like this right now where gas prices, I mean, my gas prices in my area are right around for unleaded basic, right around six to 650. Um, in LA, I've seen them up to seven just for basic. Uh, and it's definitely the highest prices I've seen. I mean, I saw some pretty high prices in San Francisco when I lived there at times, but it's definitely the highest. So if gas prices are going up and other costs are going up, which, you know, COVID, it's kind of to be expected. I think a lot of people predicted this. Uh, and I have to, I'm, I'm sitting here watching the real estate market too. Like, oh my gosh, it's wild over there. I'll talk about real estate and some personal stuff at the end of this video, the last 15 minutes. But if people are having to pay more on their, their daily stuff right now, they might look to get into reselling stuff out of their own closet, stuff from their own homes. Maybe they'll start going to some thrift stores, but I still think they're going to start and they're going to stop because it's just going to be too much work. And it is a lot of work. Um, you know, some people just want to spend 40 hours a week thrifting and sourcing online and they want to sell five items that are going to sell at $500 a piece. That brings me no joy. I don't really like the searching aspect. I like the treasure hunt, but I love selling a good $20 item that sells in a day. I just, that's me. We're all a little different. I get that. But uh, there's a lot of different resellers out there. And I think if, if people, if there's an influx of new resellers at a place or anything like that, I think that it's just gonna wanna make me be better. That's my take. Um, and I'll use, YouTube as an example, there are what feels like 500 new people starting reseller YouTube channels every day. But there are also, is that a spot? This is new with tags. So I do not think, I think I'm just gonna have to list it. This is stuff that I didn't source, by the way. I will share it in an upcoming video of what, what I've been doing recently to get product, but Anyway, so I'm not excited about any of this. You're just helping me get through it. But anyways, there are 5 million cooking channels. There are 5 million makeup channels. There are 5 million uh, lifestyle channels. There are just a bajillion YouTube channels. So the fact that we have an increase in YouTube channels in the reselling space, in my opinion, it's just gonna make everyone step it up a bit. Get more creative. 17, 25, 17, 25. Again, I don't know what I do with my hands. 17, 25. I don't really, yeah, I do actually sing when I'm here by myself, but usually I'm singing to music. <laughs> so not really just making up random. I feel like that flaw is really gonna bring down the value, but whatever. It's not a high dollar item anyways, but it's fine. Anyways, so I'm not really threatened by competition. Um, my hope is that with more resellers comes more buyers and that uh, whether it's YouTube or reselling or me right now, I'm getting into you know, a market of real estate in a very small area. And I hear people in real estate saying like, we have too many agents here and there's just not enough, um, there's not enough to list and there's not enough to sell and there's not enough buyers. And, you know, It's almost like they're trying to discourage someone new from coming on. There are plenty of people that get in real estate and realize it's too hard and they quit. I think the average is a year. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm sure the average of reselling is like six months. I'm sure the average of YouTube is less, like three months, because it's so hard to get monetized and you work so hard at it. So anyways, the point of this is, I think competition is great. I don't think we have too many resellers. I think that if someone says, resellers are doing this to my business or stores are doing this to my business or that they just wanna pass blame on something, and then maybe reselling, maybe just maybe it's just becoming more aware that that competition can be good, um, and maybe people just don't realize that. I don't know, but anyways, oh man, there's another flaw. There's a little missing guy. Where did you come from? I really just don't even want to list this right now, but if it can bring me a little bit of money, I'm gonna do it. So that's basically it for that topic. 
Um, I have so many other topics. Uh, one thing I will address is I did basically the same video, but I did one negative and one positive and the negative title and thumbnail, even though both videos were not that negative or not negative, just a negative spin, meaning looking at kind of the downside of, of reselling. That video got like 14, 15,000 views. And the one where I was like, best job ever, um, that only got like 8,000 views. And so when we do things like topics around negative things or have a negative spin on a thumbnail, it's not because the whole video is gonna be negative. It's not hopefully gonna be clickbait, at least not mine, hopefully. But it is to hopefully get you guys to watch and be a part of the conversation. And um, I don't know, I just really value the feedback and the comments that I get on these videos because it's making me better and hopefully, Hopefully, um, it will just make us all uh, think about things from a different perspective. And that's what you guys do help for me when you guys let me know your thoughts below. And hopefully, that's what I can help with you guys. So on that note, I need to go outside where it's cooler. The dog's outside, and I'll update you on more personal stuff. Hi, Boo. Hi. You want to say hi? Huh? Why are you always so dirty? What did you get today? <laughs> It is so nice out. <laughs> Even just walking down my, my ladder, uh, it starts getting cool. <laughs> I try to do in the summer my photos in the morning, but I'm, uh, I have a dentist appointment tomorrow, so I wanted to get a few photos done today because I'm going to be out of my house because my dentist is out of town. So, uh, yeah, and I'm very anxious about the dentist. It's not my favorite thing. Also, I don't know if I'm sideways on this, but it's fine. Boo, did you want to tell them in your dog language what you caught today? Did you catch a squirrel? Okay, squirrels are rodents. Uh, she's never caught one that I know of. She's caught gophers. Um, but I, I think this may have been her biggest catch yet. And she caught herself off guard. I'm not advocating for this. She is a dog. I can't control her when she's outside. And I have a lot of rodents here. <laughs> um, anyways, she caught herself off guard. And uh, she killed it. But then she like didn't know what to do with it. Fortunately, I bribed her with some chicken and some birds came and had dinner, like a turkey vulture and then a couple blackbirds. This is just nature up here. Yeah, but I just can't believe she caught it, to be honest, because they're speedy little things. But she kind of snuck up on it a, a different way. Anyways, it was pretty funny. Um, I mean, sad if you're a squirrel fan, but they create problems they squirrels I have found a squirrel in my car engine and my car engine has had major issues before with wiring being eaten by um are those happy birds that's that's a happy bird that's already eaten today oh there's two of them so anyways I have to go to the dentist tomorrow um and that's uh, it's a filling so I didn't go to the dentist for years because I had a bad experience with a crown and a filling before that and then they said I was gonna have to have another crown come to find out I didn't anyways I was kind of traumatized um, but I finally I, I finally decided I need to go oh it's because I broke a, a, a filling out of my one of my back teeth so I had a hole in my mouth a small hole like very tiny but I could feel it so I was like I really have to go so anyways, it had been years, and um, fortunately, there were only a couple of things. One that was like critical, that's the one that's tomorrow, um, and then they filled the hole a few months ago, but uh, the dentist is not my favorite place. I know it's not a favorite for a lot of people, but I like, I'm not scared of many things. I, I will break down in tears. I have broken down in tears, uh, but it's because I've had issues where the Novocaine wore off mid-treatment a few times and like that's just it's just nothing is more traumatizing for me um, This weekend's gonna be a heat wave. So it's nice today. I think the high was 75 or 76 um, But this weekend here where I live it's gonna be 90 91 Saturday Saturday Sunday or Friday Saturday anyways and it's going to be heat wave a lot of places. And I know a lot of other places get above 100, even close to me. Like the cities that I go to for grocery shopping and stuff like that, like they'll get in the hundreds almost all summer, you know, um, 100 plus. I know like, you know, parts of Nevada, you know, 110 plus. I mean, I was in Vegas one time and it was 118 for like a solid week. Oh, my gosh. So I know it gets a lot hotter other places. But when you live in kind of a mountain, higher elevation in California, you move here because you want cooler temps. You don't want heat. <laughs> so anyways, and I don't have air conditioning. So anyways, 
the hot days are just they're steamy that's okay but um so a good i'll start with a good thing and then i'll move on to a bad thing that's recently happened uh exciting thing so i've been doing yoga pretty consistently for like this this stretch of time for probably about eight months and i've done yoga on and off since i was 18 due to a car accident um so i'll get in like stints of like I'll sign up, I'll do it for a few months, and then I slowly f- fizzle out, and, and then I stop paying for it, and then I stop going. And then my back starts hurting, and then I, like, will get into it six months later. So it's kind of usually those types of things. Or I would have, like, a group on where I'd sign up for a month, and I'd be like, yay, it's cheap. And then I'd look at their real prices, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's, like, $150. This is San Francisco, but um, for a month of y- unlimited yoga. And I was just like, no, I can't. Anyways, so this is probably the – like one where I it's my social my only social thing here outside of just occasionally seeing friends um as far as like getting out of my house and going having somewhere to go this has just been really good especially after COVID but yoga is really hard um and there's a few there's a little deer over there I would switch the camera but then I will spook it um and it's a little far in the distance so but so yoga has been really good for me for both my back for having something to do and look forward to and also just health you know but um it's it's incredibly hard and I'm fairly flexible but there are just certain poses I hate I mean it's it's and some days you're great and some days you're just like I can't do anything it's just you're 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 on your own journey with yoga so anyways there's a few poses that I've just always wanted to get to and one of them is a back bend and I know if you've done back bends as children you're like oh that's no big deal I'm 40 I don't think I've done a back bend since I was a kid. Um, I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I don't think I've done one since I was a kid. And it's been one of those things in yoga classes where I've always just like, I want to get to that point where I, I can do some of the, the poses with true back bends. Anyway, so I finally am able to start doing some back bends and I've worked up with it, worked up to it. And, um, it's great for my back. It's, um, it's just showing that I'm all these poses that I'm doing is helping build strength in areas. It's also helping with like arm strength and to get up into a back bend from laying down. It's hard on the arms, um, like arm strength. So anyways, that happened. I did, I started doing wall back bends and started pushing my flexibility, like getting my legs closer to my hands. I've been doing that for probably a month, but yesterday was the first time I pushed up into a back bend on my own, no assistance, no wall. And I was just like, oh, my God. And then I tried to do it a second time. I was like, my arms are shot. (laughs) But it was kind of the end of class. So anyways, I was really excited about that. So that was a really exciting thing recently. Uh, My biggest downside that has happened, and this happened a week ago, was Luna bit a dog, not tragically, at daycare. Uh, Doggy daycare. And doggy daycare is where I have been taking her when I go thrift in L.A. Um, It's... uh, her social time because it's it's not like she's playing with deer out here um and wild animals uh luna she sees a deer running and now she's running um oh the deer got scared because someone turned on their like a garden tractor um anyways so i picked her up uh, like a week and a half ago and i had her boarded because i had I needed to have her stay overnight and so she was there for two full days and when I picked her up the owner who's always been very nice to me um basically long story short she bit a dog it was not a dog that was agitated it was an older dog he's like this dog has never had any issues it wasn't like she was reacting no she just like out of nowhere and she has behavioral issues and I've been kind of shocked that she hasn't had gotten in trouble there more often um and we talked and he said, you know, maybe try this and maybe try this and, you know, you, you, training and this and this. And I, and so we had a conversation and originally I left there thinking I was going to start training with her there. But I, unfortunately, when I go to L.A., I go to thrift. I go for work purposes and to take time out of that work day since I go thrifting so rarely um, to train my dog so that she can attend daycare. Not only does that cost me more money, daycare is twenty nine dollars a day. Um, and that's just for daycare. That's not for boarding. And so tap on private training so that she, they know that I'm trying to work on her and her issues and take time out of my thrifting days. It just, it was seeming like that wouldn't be the best option. So then I, I reached out to a couple trainers up here where I live 
and one didn't respond and one responded with, I don't think it's a training issue. I think it's, come here, Bill. Come, come here. I know you got it. I don't know what you're eating over there, but you don't need to eat something on the ground to make your stomach upset, right? Can you just lay down, chill for a little bit? We'll play in a second. So anyways, this other trainer up here, I explained the, the issue and she's like basically blaming the daycare saying, I think you need to find a new daycare. I don't think it's a training issue. I'm like, no, my dog is not the best trained. I mean, we did training when she was a puppy in San Francisco, but part of it is, is that she used to be an everyday daycare dog. She was in a city environment around a lot of stimulation. And then I moved here and she was still going to daycare when I was commuting to work. So she was still getting that stimulation and car rides and all of that. And then I, you know, almost four years, no, what? A little over three years ago, I went full time and I've been working from home and you know, she's lucky to go to daycare, you know, two to three times a month maybe four times a month. And it's just been become more inconsistent. Um, she does not do well at dog parks because she just gets overwhelmed and overstimulated. And so we don't go to those anymore. So anyways, it's just, uh, it's hard. It's hard because I want her, she likes playing with dogs, but I also can't ha run the risk. And I know, I know her well enough to know that this, once she does that, she's just going to keep doing it. Cause that's, that's how she communicates. Anyway, so I've had to think of some other options um, because I do need a place to take her at times. Um, my dad used to come up and watch her occasionally, um, especially during COVID when they weren't going anywhere. And um, my dad obviously had a heart condition, so it wasn't safe for him to really leave the house much. But uh, he would come up here and watch the dog and my mom and I would go thrift. And uh, so he was just a good uh, backup option. And and. I don't have that backup option anymore. And I do have a couple friends here, but I, I just have always liked daycare because I'm self-sufficient and I don't need to ask people for help. I don't need to worry about anything. Um, so it's it's been a little overwhelming, uh, but I have a couple options that I'm thinking of. Uh, one is a, da a doggy door. So because we have so much wildlife here, a regular doggy door is not a great option because then wild animals can get in my house, but they do have electronic kind that, and I'm sure some of you guys have, have them or have used them. And I'm sure I'll get comments below if you make it to this part of the video, but basically where something would be connected to her collar. And, uh, so when she walks up to the doggy decor, doggy door, it will open for her. But if a wild animal wants to walk in or like if she's inside, it won't open if there's something outside. I don't know. Anyways, I have a friend who had one and they said it worked really well and, but they're like $800 for the kind that goes into the sliding glass door. And I, I, I mean, or you have to pay a contractor to put a hole in the wall or into a door and that's not something I want. So anyways, so it's just, but that's what I would pay for doggy daycare in a year. So I think that's an option. And then if I have to stay overnight somewhere, I can just pay someone up here to come and give her new water and feed her and take her on a walk. Um, and I do have some friends with dogs that she can play with, but um, it's just kind of a bummer because she's been going to daycare. I mean, her puppy daycare, when, she, when I first got her and she wasn't fully vaccinated and I had my tech job, um, I could bring her to the office, but I had meetings all the time. And you can't really easily focus on meetings when you've got a puppy running around peeing all over the office like it's just not, it's not great so I took her to the office one day a week but four days out of the week they charged $75 a day for puppy daycare because they had to put the puppies that weren't vaccinated in a different room to keep them away from other dogs so they wouldn't catch certain diseases and I mean so she's been going to daycare her entire life and so it's just it's kind of heartbreaking for me um but I kind of saw the day coming so anyways the last thing, really no real estate update. I've got a couple people I'm working with. Um, I did show houses again, and uh, it is becoming a little easier for buyers right now. So I'm hopeful that this market will stabilize a little bit because it was just so hard for the last six months for buyers. And, um, and that's mostly what I focus on, our buyers. So, because I don't know anyone here to list anything, but uh, so I don't really have much on real estate, but I'll keep you guys posted. Um, Hopefully something comes around soon or a, a, an accepted offer comes soon. Um, the last thing that I would address is that I noticed that my channel has been, was very, very consistent for a while. Like all my videos were just doing really great, very consistently great. And then I started doing these chatty work with me's and all of a sudden, 
while the chatty work with me's were getting great views and you guys were leaving me all this positive feedback and I was like okay great you guys seem to like this it was doing this weird thing where it was like people weren't watching it oh what is it's like a bug there's also birds above so maybe it's not a bug anyways um nature so I think I have a suspicion that these videos are actually hurting the rest of my videos kind of making the YouTube algorithm off it's confusing it because a lot of people don't watch these videos in the first day the they'll st it'll start trending 10 out of 10 and then in a week or two weeks it'll be one out of 10. it'll pick up the traction over time unlike most of my other videos the most of the views happen in the first day or two or three so i don't know i know you guys really like them and i really enjoy all the positive feedback and it's just it's making my other videos a little hard to do because they're not getting the views they're not getting recommended so i'm at this weird place with youtube right now but I'll figure it out. It's part of the joy of, you know, problem solving. So that's basically it. I'm going to drink my drink and play with the dog for a little bit. Right, right, boo? And um, we'll see you in the next video. So I hope everyone's doing well. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.